Hello and welcome back. Today we want to talk about the cell and it is the smallest unit of life. So first we want to talk about cell theory and this is uh, the theory that describes everything we know about cells. It is a fundamental tenet of biology and it goes a little bit like this. All living things are made up of cells and cells are the smallest bits of life that you can get. A cell is the smallest living thing. Anything smaller than a cell is not alive. You just have parts of a cell or something completely different. And cells don't just come out of nowhere. You have to have a cell that divides, and that is how you get new cells from pre-existing cells. So there's cell theory. And here are some examples of some cells. Right, you have an amoeba here, and these are really cool. If you remind me in class, I'll show you a video of something called cytoplasmic streaming. These guys move around by um, extending out their membrane, their plasma membrane here, and then they flow into the projection. It's very cool. So if you remind me, I will show you a video. Neat stuff. Okay, this is a cell inside of a plant stem, and you can see that these two things are different, right? Cells are the shape of cell is going to follow its function. Okay, here's a little red blood cell, right? And I think they're really cute because they look like little baskets. Uh, and in fact, they carry oxygen. And then you have a nerve cell. This is going to conduct signals to and from the brain. And then here you have a bacteria cell, right? Um, you have a nice uh, little bacillus. That's the shape. It's a rod shape here. Um, and of course, some of these you are familiar with because they make you super sick. Right. And in some cases, you're not familiar with them, but you probably have more bacteria cells on you than you actually have people cells. So enjoy that thought. OK, so the first question that I want to ask you, though, is why are cells so small? OK, you have to look at surface area in this case. Right. Cells exchange nutrients. They exchange waste products. They exchange gases across their membrane. And they need to be able to have enough surface area to, to move those products um, or, you know, whatever, efficiently. Okay, nutrients in, waste out is essentially what we're looking at. If they, if they get too big, right, remember, as they get big, they're going to need more nutrients and make more waste. Okay, so as they get bigger, though, their surface area to volume ratio decreases. And so you have a need for more stuff, but you actually have less space relatively to get it across. And so cells are limited by this surface area to volume ratio. Okay. So strategies for increasing surface area, so cells can be larger, include their shape. They can be long and narrow, right? They can have uh, frills, like if you think about the microvilli in, in your intestines, that, that extends the surface area. Cells can have those too, but if you have just a regular old round cell, it will always be the smallest, okay? Okay, so here's your first question. You're told that the cells on a microscope slide are plant, animal, or bacterial, okay? You look at them through the microscope and see cell walls and membrane-bound organelles. You're going to conclude that the cells are, or could be, Okay, so could they be plant, animal, or bacterial? Maybe either plant or bacterial. They're only animal cells, they're only bacteria, or they're only plant cells. Well, this is where we need to start asking ourselves, what is unique or what are the hallmarks of different kinds of cells? It turns out that if you have cell walls and membrane-bound organelles, the only thing that you could be is a plant cell, okay? And the question becomes why, right? Well. You have two basic types of cells, eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Your prokaryotes are going to be your bacteria, and then animal and plant cells are going to be the eukaryotes. So why is a bacteria a prokaryote and everything else is a eukaryote? Okay, it has no DNA, has no membrane-bound nucleus, it has cilia, or it's a single cell. Well, we know that bacteria are single cells, right? They're unicellular, okay? It does not have membrane, sorry, membrane-bound nucleus. It does not have any membrane-bound organelles. It's just got stuff inside of it. The only membrane it's got is going to be the plasma membrane. So the answer is actually the no membrane-bound nucleus. 
Cilia are just little projections. They look like little hairs. They help it travel. But the one I want to talk about most, though, two is the answer, but it has no DNA. That's crazy talk. If you have no DNA, you're not alive. You're not a cell, okay? All living things have DNA. It is the genetic material. It is the instructions for what they are. And we will talk about DNA more, but I just wanted to touch on that really quick. All right, so prokaryotes, they are unicellular, all of them. All of them are unicellular. They don't have structures surrounded by membranes, so it means they have no uh, organelles. They have very few internal structures at all, actually. They've got ribosomes, and that's pretty exciting. Um, and the two groups, right, the two domains that are prokaryotic are bacteria and archaea. And we will talk about the differences between those more when we start talking about phylogeny. All right, so prokaryotic cells, super simple. They've got some ribosomes. Uh, they have some DNA in them. That's great. Yeah. And then they are surrounded by a plasma membrane. Uh, they may, they have a, typically have a cell wall. Okay. Um, and the cell wall is going to differ depending on what kind of bacteria you have. You might have heard something like gram positive or gram negative. The differences between those have a lot to do with the cell membrane. Sorry, the cell wall, not cell membrane, cell wall. And then some of them actually have capsule. And then you have these little guys um, out here, this, the cilia, and then you oftentimes have a flagella. Every projection out here has two, one of two functions. Flagella and cilia are for movement, um, and the pili are for sexual reproduction. Okay, and then over here you can see that there are three uh, basic types uh, of bacteria in terms of their shape. Bacteria oftentimes are classified by their shape. Here you have coccus, as in like, uh, streptococcus or staphylococcus and then here you have a bacillium right that's the shape here bacillus uh, is the rod shape and then here you have spirillium and these are these cool spiral shapes okay eukaryotes and that's what we're going to be dealing with because we're made up of eukaryotic cells these are organisms that have a nucleus uh, they actually also have membrane-bound organelles and stuff like that. But the key there is the, the actual formed nucleus. They can either be unicellular, as in the case of the protists, or they can be multicellular, plants and animals, good example of that. And then fungi can either be unicellular or multicellular. All right, so eukaryotic cells, you're actually looking at an animal cell here. You've seen this picture a million times before, I'm sure. We're going to talk about each of these things. And then here's just an example of a plant cell versus an animal cell because they are different in some respects. In some respects, they're the same, and we'll discuss that too. So structures present in plant cells but not in animal cells include mitochondria and vacuoles, ribosomes in the ER, chloroplasts in the cell wall, lysosomes, or the, and the Golgi apparatus. Okay, well... Plant cells have chloroplasts and a cell wall. If you think back to the microscope question, we saw this, the cell wall situation there. But they also have chloroplasts, and we'll talk about those at the end. Okay, so basic cell structure. Each cell has four common components, no matter what it is, whether it's prokaryote or eukaryote. Um, it has plasma membrane. It has cytoplasm. That's that jelly stuff. And there are ribosomes in it. Ribosomes are really important. We'll talk about them later in the course. It has a region containing DNA, whether it's just a nucleoid region, as in a prokaryote, or an actual nucleus, as in a eukaryote. And then there are biochemical molecules and biochemical pathways that are the processes of life. And a lot of those are actually very similar, Similar, right? You have to transport across the, the plasma membrane. You have to make sure that you can get waste in and out, right? Which is part of the transport, but also to where it needs to go in the cell. Um, it's making all sorts of, of products that help it be alive or do whatever it needs to do. So, so let's start with the plasma membrane. Uh, this is going to control what enters and leaves the cell. And it's very complex. It's very cool, actually. It's made of lipids, right? And you have, those are hydrophobic. And it's cool because you have this hydrophilic head, and then you have these hydrophobic tails, and they're attracted to each other. And this is what allows for you to have a water-based fluid on the outside and a water-based fluid on the inside. And then you'll have proteins and carbohydrates uh, combinations of those. The proteins will actually span through the plasma membrane, which allows things to come in and out. They can be gates or channels that allow for particles uh, and to move in and out, right? 
And then you have some proteins that have attachments on them. Here's a carbohydrate. This forms a glycoprotein. These can be identifiers. They can be used to tether to other cells, whatever. So the plasma membrane is very interesting and it's very active. Now, in a eukaryotic cell, right, we've got the plasma membrane. They can have microvilli or not. We've talked about the cytoplasm. Now we want to talk about the cytoplasmic organelles, right, the cytoskeleton. And unfortunately, we're not going to talk a whole lot about the cytoskeleton, but the cytoskeleton is really cool. It's made of uh, actin and microtubules, and we will talk a little bit about the cytoskeleton when we start talking about mitosis, but this is what allows the uh, cell to have its structure. It's what allows things like amoeba to move and also a transport of materials throughout the cell. The cell is really like a city or a factory and there's all kinds of things going on. And so the cytoskeleton uh, can be thought of in some ways, one of the functions of the cytoskeleton is a highway system. Okay, And then all of these we're about to talk about. Your nuclear envelope, really important. It's got pores, which are made of proteins. They're nuclear pores. Uh, they're a lot like the, the pores or channels on the plasma membrane because you have to get things in and out of the nucleus, and we'll talk about that later on. Uh, nucleoplasma nuclei, and then, of course, nucleoli, and then, of course, DNA, right? And we'll talk a lot about chromosomes and DNA later. So cytoplasm, cytoplasm it's the jelly-like stuff, primary component, water. We talked about that. Organelles. Let's start with the nucleus because it's the most important, right? It directs the cell activities. It's got the DNA, right, the genetic material. It's the site of all of your DNA synthesis and your RNA transcription and processing. We'll talk about that later on. Um, and then it is separate, right? It is its own little unique area. And you can see that, ooh, nucleus, yay, nucleus. By the way, I love this picture because you can see the cytoskeleton. That green is all the cytoskeleton. Very cool stuff. And I just said that this was the most important. That's not actually true. They're, everything's equally important. So now the nucleus is not the only organelle that has DNA. So, who else has DNA? Well, it turns out that ribosomes do not have DNA, but they are made of RNA, and we'll talk about that later in the course as well. But both mitochondria and chloroplasts have DNA, and we will talk about why in uh, a later class in this unit. Nucleolus. This is actually inside the nucleus itself. It's just a region where you have some condensed DNA and it's where all of the ribosomal RNA is transcribed. The ribosomal RNA, like the messenger RNA, is going to leave the nucleus through the nuclear pores. The nuclear membrane, that's the nuclear envelope. It surrounds the nucleus. We've talked about that a little bit already. Mitochondria. Mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. This is a, the site of cellular respiration which is the energy process. That's what's going to generate ATP. They do contain DNA and they can replicate themselves. They are uh, in endosymbiotes and we will talk about this in a later lecture. I've just kind of introduced it here, but we'll talk about that later on. Here are some mitochondria. Yay, pretty exciting. Now, the interesting thing about mitochondria is like chloroplasts, they have a double membrane. All of the other organelles in the cell have single membranes, but they actually have an outer and inner membrane, and that's going to be important when we start talking about this endosymbiote thing. Ribosomes. Ribosomes are found in all cells, remember, not just eukaryotes, but all cells. They are the things that translate mRNA into proteins, and proteins do all kinds of exciting things that we will talk about later on. Okay. Now, they can either be free in the cytoplasm or they can be attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, which is what we're going to talk about now. The endoplasmic reticulum is a layered membrane that is actually attached to the nuclear membrane, and you can see that it's right here, Okay, uh, and then it continues on, and then over here is going to be the Golgi apparatus. You can see that a little bit right here, uh, and though there's a, there's a progression from the nucleus to the endoplasmic reticulum reticulum to the Golgi body, right, Golgi apparatus. So this is where proteins, a lot of proteins, most proteins are actually going to be synthesized. They are synthesized on the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. They are put into the inner space, right, the lumen, inner space is lumen, 
of the of the ER, right, in a plasma particulum, and that is where they are going to be folded and modified in any way that's necessary. Then they'll be sent to the Golgi apparatus, which is here, um, and the Golgi is actually going to sort them, package them into vesicles, and it will send them where they need to go. Sometimes there'll be some more modifications that need to be made, and they're made in the Golgi bodies. They also make lysosomes, which we're going to talk about later on too. Okay, lysosomes, or now actually, lysosomes, these are the digestive bodies, right? They can um, digest nutrients, right? And so they can, they store enzymes that break down food. They can transport materials to the cell membrane for removal, right? And here's the other thing that's really important. They will destroy cell organelles and the cell itself, as well as foreign invaders. So the lysosomes are a defense mechanism, but they also, when it's time, cells undergo something called apoptosis, which is a programmed cell death. The lysosomes will be activated and they will break down the cell as it's, as it's dying. And also when you have um, necrosis of the cells, and that's an injury-driven cell death, they'll take care of that as well. Vacuoles, these are just sacs. They just hold stuff until it's sent off to do whatever it's supposed to do. So they're just bags. So which of the following is not involved in the synthesis or modification of new molecules? Well, if you're paying attention at all in what I just said, it would be vacuoles. They only store stuff. Ribosomes, the endoplasmic reticulum, and the Golgi apparatus um, are either involved in synthesis, that would be the ribosomes, and ER and Golgi are modification. All right, now cell wall. We talked about the cell wall. Animal cells don't have these. Plants, algae, and bacteria um, do. They have this tough outer structure. It provides additional support. It protects the cell from pressures, especially if it's a cell that will move. Um, plants, it's what gives it that rigid structure. Um, you know, so very important. And we're not going to talk about a whole lot because we're not talking about plants, but they're actually really, really cool. And plants cells have plant cells have a little bit different um, process of mitosis, cellular reproduction, because of the cell wall, and we will talk about that a little teeny bit. All right, and then plants right also have algae and some bacteria too. Plants also have chloroplasts, and chloroplasts contain their own DNA. They also contain chlorophyll, which is what is responsible for photosynthesis, or at least driving photosynthesis. Um, we are not going to talk about photosynthesis in this class, although it is super interesting. These are also endosymbiotes, uh, cyanobacteria as opposed to purple bacteria, and again we'll talk about that in a later lecture. And they have that same double membrane, which is so important to this endosymbiote thing. And then of course here's just a plant cell, which you've already seen. Now, there are some other things, right? Like, I don't know about you, but I love some delicious bread. Yeah? And the driving force of bread is yeast. It's alive. It's why you put it in warm water. It's why it makes all the delicious gas bubbles that make your bread awesome, right? Uh, and so, what is it, though? Is it a prokaryote? Is it bacteria? Is it a eukaryote, right? Um, is it a eukaryotic fungus? Is it an animal? Or is it a plant? Well, we can start off by saying there are no eukaryotic bacteria. No, 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 no. So B is just wrong, okay? It's not a bacteria. Uh, it's not a plant. So is it an animal or fungus? Some people call yeast an animal, but that's actually not correct. Yeast is a fungus. And here is just a picture. Uh, fungus cells are different. They are eukaryotic. Um, they do have a cell wall, but it's made of um, chitin as opposed to peptidoglycan or cellulose or whatever, uh, depending on whether it's a bacteria or a plant. And so there's different structure, but it's got the same basic organelles in it, uh, and it does all the same stuff. And so you don't really need to know about the fungus cells, but I just thought it would be interesting because we all love mushrooms. Okay, maybe not all of us, but some of us love mushrooms. And, um, well, yeast products. Yay. Okay, and that is it for this one. You will, of course, will have a mini quiz. And um, thanks for listening. See you next time. Or here, see you next time.